Thank you, Dr. Pace. It's um, an incredible encouragement to look out and see God's grace, even on our lives, as I look out and see uh, family. I see Southeastern family. I look out and I see Central Baptist Church family. Uh, and I see Wake Crossroads Baptist Church family, and that is just, again, a picture of God's grace toward us in all that He has done really over the past 23 years. Uh, as, I, as I stand here today, I would have had no idea 23 years ago, actually this or last month, that I would possibly be standing here uh, in this capacity to preach. And so when I got the email uh, that I was going to receive an email, I thought, wow, what a blessing, what an honor. And then I got that follow-up email, and it said, you're invited to preach in chapel, and Revelation 6 is your topic. I immediately texted Dr. Aiken, and I said, brother, I thought you loved your pastor, and now I'm not sure. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, I shared that with my wife, and she said, yeah, I know, it, it, yes, it's a challenge, but what, a, what an honor. People like, you know, John Piper and David Platt and others have preached. I said, you're not helping. <laughs> you know, as, as I have, have studied this passage and prepared to, to stand here and share God's word with you today, the thing that God has just impressed on my heart, knowing full well, I'm no David Platt and no John Piper. Here's the thing. What matters is not who is standing here proclaiming the word, but the one whom we are proclaiming. Jesus Christ and him crucified, buried, risen, and coming again. And so I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles with you, to Revelation 6. As we continue this study in Revelation, and as we look at uh, this issue here from the, the whole chapter this morning, uh, under the heading, we are almost there. We're almost there. Revelation 6, uh, this is the word of the Lord. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse, and its rider held a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out as a conqueror in order to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its rider was allowed to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And a large sword was given to him. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a set of scales in his hand. Then I heard something like a voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. But do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following after him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild animals of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long until you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? So they were given a white robe. And they were told to rest a little while longer until the number would be completed of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were going to be killed just as they had been. Then I saw him open the sixth seal. A violent earthquake occurred. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of hair. The entire moon became like blood 
The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a high wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Would you pray with me? Father, we ask now in these moments for your help. God, we ask for the work of your Holy Spirit to take your word and to speak to our hearts. God, that we might hear from you. God, that we might then, having heard, respond in faith and obedience as you would speak to us this day from your word. And God, our prayer would be that as we have heard and responded, God, we pray that when we leave, every one of us would look more like Jesus than when we came. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're almost there. Most of you who have uh, children know well what it is to go on a long car trip uh, with your kids and to hear that blessed question, are we there yet? With our kids growing up some uh, nine hours away from all of our family, especially when our kids were young, uh, 23 and more years ago, we would prepare and we would let them know it's going to be nine hours, it's going to be a long ride. It didn't matter. We would barely leave the driveway or maybe be five minutes down the road. The question would come, and then about every 15 minutes along the way, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you know, the reality is down through the ages, God's children are not a lot different in asking such questions. Frequently, we, I mean, they would ask, are we there yet? The prophets would foretell that coming day. Jesus' disciples would ask, when is that day coming? And and help us to know and understand exactly what it's going to look like when that time comes. All of these times through history we've seen and heard that type of question. We look around us today, don't we, and we see all kinds of unprecedented cosmic events, the rise and fall of governments. We see calamity taking place all around us. We see conflict among men and all of these things on the world scene. We see the expansion of global currency. We see implantable, digital, scannable technology. And we hear the question all around us, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, as we consider that question and as we consider these verses, I want us to see here clearly what the Scripture shows to us in in Revelation 6, which is simply this, before Christ returns, He will pour out His wrath on sin. Before Christ returns, He will pour out His wrath on sin. There are great parallels between this passage and those words of Jesus to His disciples there in Matthew 24. Where again, they're asking about those things which will be to come and the signs of them where he describes to them these these things will happen and when they do, they will be the beginning of birth pangs, but the end is not yet. And so that's why I would say to us this morning, that's why we would approach this chapter here along those lines of we're almost there but not yet. As we look at the events that unfold here in Revelation 6, I want us to see some truths that we can latch on to and hold on to as we see these horrible things beginning to unfold. The first one that should encourage us, just briefly, is this. The Lamb is in control. 
The lamb is in control. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I know it was the thrust of last time, but I think it's worth us noting that there in Revelation 5 and in the introductory words here in verse 6, then I saw the lamb. It's important for us to just note here as we begin to see the things that follow that the lamb of God, the one who was slain and is alive forevermore, the only one who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll. He is in absolute control through all that is about to be demonstrated and take place. Jesus does not need to take the wheel. He's never lost control of it. The lamb is in control. There's intentionality and there is purpose in the things that are taking place, even as John sees one by one the lamb beginning to loosen those scrolls that the scroll, the seals that the scroll might begin to unfold. It is under his authority, that authority of the lamb of God that these events take place. Be encouraged as you, as you read these verses, the lamb is in control. But the second thing that I want us to see this morning is this. We have to see in the midst of these verses, his wrath is poured out. His wrath is poured out. There is obviously a significant degree to which this even very idea of the wrath of God or the Lamb in so many cases is is turned away from, is repudiated. Uh, I have personally experienced what it is to have those who would who would rail against even the very notion of there being any kind at all of wrath of God. And yet as we read these verses, we can make make no mistake because when you look down at the very end that we'll see as we get there in a moment in verses 16 and 17, there's no question what is taking place as those who are experiencing that outpouring are saying specifically, here is the reason for that. It is the wrath of the Lamb. And then as he looks at the one who is sitting on the throne, it's referred to as their wrath, noting that same wrath that it is one. Listen, we can understand the idea or the, the desire to turn away from the idea of the wrath of God because we think about it in terms of our own wrath, don't we? I am very familiar that if, if I find myself in a place of anger or even, as we might call, wrath, I can assure you those things, the way I would be inclined in my fallen humanity and sinfulness to express it, will not work the righteousness of God. And yet the Scripture is clear, not so with God. His wrath is not like ours. The one who is seated on the throne and the Lamb will exercise a righteous wrath, one that is perfectly just, one that is completely controlled, and one that will be poured out on sin. As the Lamb begins to open the seals that would then be followed in subsequent chapters by the bowls and the trumpets, His wrath is is unleashed on the earth. And as John, no doubt, is hearkening back to the prophecies of Zechariah 1 and sees these four horses and their riders coming forth, depicted in this vision, each one in turn, not showing up on their own initiative or their own volition or in some willy-nilly disoriented kind of manner, but rather at the unrolling of and under the leading of the Lamb who is loosening the seals, and those of the great beast who are calling come, the living creatures. Listen, there's obviously much discussion about the timing of this, these events as they unfold. Have they happened at some time in the past? Are they occurring even now today in our midst? Or are these referring to those events that one day will come yet in the future? I appreciate the way one writer describes sort of what we see here and yet our experience today, noting it as sort of us today seeing the shadows, as it were, of of these four horses and their horsemen approaching and yet recognizing that the great severity and fullness of all that is described here will come yet one day in the future when they finally arrive. And listen again, make no mistake, these horses and their riders are not riding under their own control or simply by 
their own authority or volition. They are responding to that which is being declared by the one who is over all things. When we consider what we see today, there's, there's, no, there's no arguing that we certainly see the shadow of deception and power craving among worldly governments. The kind of thing that we see described here by this horse, this white horse and its rider and the one who is carrying this bow that has been given, perhaps pointing ahead to the, to the short-term reign of Antichrist when he would come there near the end of time. But make no mistake, as we, as we see this and we read of this white horse and the rider who sits upon it, not confusing that it is the one who is described there in Revelation 19 who will come in victory, riding on a white horse, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Listen, when Christ comes in Revelation 19, riding on that white horse, he's not coming to kick off these things that are happening. He's coming to bring them to an end. We see the shadow of war and bloodshed today like that that's depicted there in verses 3 and 4, as you see that, that red horse, the fiery red one that is coming, and its rider. We see the effects of it around us. We see it in the Middle East. We see it in West Africa. We see the potential for it increasingly so in places like Ukraine, where there is not only, there is not only conflict and warfare and bloodshed taking place between countries, but even within them. I think about those who are, who are close friends of mine who have served our Lord in difficult places where because of these kinds of things had to keep a bag for each one of their family members packed by the door waiting because of the, the incredible press of civil war in the places they were serving having to be ready at a moment's notice. That if the, if the bloodshed and the killing around them became even greater than it was or became so close that it did not have any sense of wisdom for them to stay in that place, having to be ready to go. Them experiencing personally the reality of these kinds of things. And yet, as my people from Alabama would say, when these days come, we ain't seen nothing yet. The beginnings of birth pains. We see the shadow of the approaching black horse that we see mentioned here in verses 5 and 6, particularly in places like sub-Saharan Africa where, where famine and pestilence are so severe and taking the lives of so many. You see the cascading nature, the progression that's taking place here as each of the subsequent horses and riders come. The great power and overthrow of power-hungry governments leading to war uh, among countries and within that lead to, because of political instability and failure of growing crops and all the rest, that bring about a famine and death as a result because of the lack of food. We think about places like East Africa, countries like Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia. World hunger just in 2021 noted that some Seven million people just in that area of East Africa at risk of starvation from lack of food. And at the same time, some 34 million others facing great food scarcity with the threat of coming death as a result of lack of nutrition. But we don't see among us that kind of widespread severity where even as we see the description here, where it would take even a full day's wage simply for a daily ration for an individual person. We're almost there by this point, but not yet. From the effects of war and starvation and pestilence today, we see the shadow, don't we, of this fourth horse, the pale green one. And its rider, who is appropriately named Thanatos, death. And the one who comes closely behind him, his close companion, Hades, who is with him. The thing that I want you to notice, though, again, as you look here 
just as in the same way of those previous horses and horsemen who came, I want you to notice again the reality of the authority where it's coming from, that these, this is not their own volition, this is not their own authority. They, they, are, they don't have the freedom to simply turn loose and do whatever it is that they please with whatever. There's a, there's a sense of measuredness and there's a sense of given authority that has a limit because I want you to see here, even as it is noted there in the end of verse 8, they were given authority. And yet at the same time, we see, again, as I think about this being not happening fully in an expression of today, and yet simply a shadow of that which is to come, we see, we see the scope of the severity of what is described here, where it tells us that they were given authority over a fourth of the earth. Imagine if such were to take place even today, that would be nearly two billion people to experience this kind of ravaging. At this point, we may be almost there, but we aren't there yet. And yet we feel the weight of the delay of Christ's return, don't we, as we see the opening of the fifth seal. I want you to, to listen to these words again. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long, how long until you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? The third thing I want you to see is this, his people are preserved. His people are preserved. You know, as... As the Lamb opens this fifth seal, John sees an altar, perhaps reference to the bronze altar of sacrifice, perhaps the golden altar of incense there in the heavenly place. But below it are the souls of those who were faithful to the Lamb. And why is it he tells us that they are there? Why is it that, that these have died and, and find their selves, themselves there in that place? He tells us it's because they were faithful to the Lamb. They had been slaughtered. Why? Because of the Word of God and the testimony they had given. They cried out to their despotes, their sovereign king. They call out to the one that they had followed all the way even to their death, and they call out that, that famous calling that we would hear even on the burdened heart often of the psalmists who would cry out with that cry, How long, O Lord? It's not a cry, I don't believe, of personal retribution. Seeking personal payment for those that had wronged them, no. I believe it's a call for divine faithfulness and divine justice, and it is a call that will certainly be heard and heeded. The Apostle Paul addresses that very thing, as you see there in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. He says, friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Listen, God has not promised to protect his people from suffering. In fact, the clear reality of Scripture is Jesus said that we should not expect to escape it, but rather we should expect to experience it. But in the midst of experiencing suffering for the sake of the name, we can know that we will not be left alone and we will not be forgotten. His people will be preserved. The cry of those that John sees below the altar whose very lives have been poured out for the sake of the name of the Lamb and for the gospel. They will be dressed in the white robes of the very righteousness of Christ, whom they served even to death. Their cry will be heard, and God's just judgment will be poured out on sin. 
But before that certain judgment takes place, he tells them there will be more. He warns them, there will, be, there will be others who will come. They were given a white robe and they were told to rest a little while longer until the number would be completed of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were going to be killed just as they had been. Before that just judgment would come, even more will lose their lives. But listen, those who had already lost their lives for the sake of Christ could wait in patience, and those who are serving Christ today can serve in perseverance even in the face of death because the one who has called us is faithful. God's people are preserved. These who are here pictured or unnamed. Similar to those at the end of Hebrews 11, likewise, that are unnamed, and yet who we are told the world was not worthy of them. These were unnamed, but I couldn't help but think of names. Names like Stephen and Paul, names like Polycarp, names like Jim Elliot, names like Dr. Martha Myers, in Yemen, and names like Larry and Jean Elliott, whose son was a member of our church at Wake Crossroads. I sat in his living room hours after he had gotten word that his mom and dad had been killed in Iraq, exploring a mission of how they could take water to the people there in order to tell them of the living water they could know through Christ. I remember him standing on this very platform, giving honor to his mom and dad who had given their lives for the sake of the name and said their lives were not in vain. Finally, we see here in this text, his creation crumbles and his enemies tremble. His creation crumbles and his enemies tremble. We see that in the in these last verses as the sixth seal is open there in verses 12 and following. The prophets foretold the coming of such cataclysmic events. You see them in places like Joel chapters 2 and 3. You see them in Ezekiel 32 and 38. Isaiah 32 and 34 that mentions these, these kinds of, of cataclysmic events that will happen when the end is coming near the day of the Lord. Yeah, I couldn't help but think the perfect creation that appeared at Christ's word, that was subjected to futility because of sin. Here we see completely coming apart as all heaven breaks loose. And yet it's just before in glorious recreation, our Lord and King will make all things new. But you see, the reality is a day of accounting is coming for all. There's none who will escape. In fact, John makes very clear as he draws and, and paints with a broad brush the, the wide strata of all of humanity from greatest to least. Kings and paupers, slaves and free. Those who had appeared so powerful now in abject horror seeking to hide. And I thought about, I thought about them hiding in these mountains and caves and thought, you know, it's the epitome of folly to seek to hide in created things from the one who created all things. And yet even the greatest, again, to the least. They're hiding there, seeking peace, but no peace can be afforded for them. Why? Because they had rejected the very one who himself is our peace. And instead are left with nothing but terror. Rather than crying out in repentance and faith, they not now cry out in terror and fear. Those who thought they were large and in charge on the worldly stage are no greater than paupers and slaves. There is only one who is great, 
the slaughtered lamb who is alive, the one who has come and who is coming again. He alone is great. You see, they're seeking to hide from his face. But you know, even as we sung just a little while ago, listen, beloved, because of the work that Christ has done for us in our faith in him who is Lord and King, these at the end who have rejected Christ are seeking to hide from the face of the one who sits on the throne. But we who know Christ look forward and long to see his face one day when he comes again. Who can stand The question is asked here at the end. The reality is of those who have rejected Christ and the forgiveness in life that only he can bring, the answer is clear. No one can stand. So what does that mean for us? As we consider these realities here from Revelation 6 where we know the end is coming but is not yet. We're almost there. But not yet. How do we respond today in faithfulness, in obedience, in light of the fact that these things are true? Just a few admonitions to us. If the uncertainty of the timing of Christ's return has you parsing charts rather than proclaiming Christ, you're doing it wrong. If you're spending more time trying to figure out with certainty what Christ has said that we cannot know rather than going faithfully to make him known, we're not doing it right. If you were to weigh the time spent in coffee shop conversations with other believers about the timing and some of the particulars of the return of Christ, and eschatology rather than spending time and you were to weigh your time of personal evangelism in proclaiming the one that we say is coming again how would that time weigh out as we continue on down this road of life knowing that the end is coming but we're not there yet the hoofbeats of these approaching horsemen thunder loud They're growing louder and louder, but we also recognize the reality of what that means for those who have rejected Christ. So, does the burden of our prayers for the lost and the urgency of our pleading with the lost accurately demonstrate what we claim to believe about Christ and the certainty of his return? Brothers and sisters, great clarity and conviction in our orthodoxy should result in great fervency and consistency in our orthopraxy. What that means is if we really believe the things that we're learning and studying in the classroom, it ought to change the way we live in the community. Southeastern Seminary has as its mission to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by equipping students to serve the church and to fulfill the Great Commission. When I think about this school and its influence even in the churches in our area and across our country and around the world, I think about this school in light of one word that you see everywhere. If I asked you, no doubt you could say it. That word is go. Because Jesus came the first time, bringing salvation. Because we know he is coming again, bringing judgment before making all things new. May we be faithful to go and take the good news of life and forgiveness through Christ to our neighbors and the nations until our triumphant king returns. God, help us to be faithful. Father, we ask even now that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would cause us to walk with greater 
conviction and fervency and consistency in our practice as we would declare to those around us who don't yet know Christ but need to. Knowing the end is coming, but not yet. God, by the power of your Spirit, give us boldness to proclaim as we should proclaim, perhaps even if it means at the very cost of our lives. Because the one who has called us and saved us is faithful. Use us, we pray, for your glory and for the advance of your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name.